Hi, my name is Rebecca Stump and I'm here today as the Senior Membership Manager at PEN America. On behalf of nearly 5,000 writers, translators, and editors of PEN, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Annual PEN World Voices Festival of International Literature. Briefly, PEN America is an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to project open expression at home and abroad. We champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. This is no ordinary time for PEN America. We face unprecedented threats to our most important shared values, and your support is so important to us in fighting to protect freedom of expression and the press, defending fact-based discourse, and resisting measures that would impair the, the free flow of ideas. For more information about Penn and details about other festival events, you can visit penn.org or check out the program, um, the festival programs that are on the table out in the hallway. Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors and supporters and the volunteers who make the Penn World Voices Festival possible. Thank you all for coming here this evening, and thanks to our guests for agreeing to take part in what promises to be a very wonderful event. Thank you. It's academic and it's theater, and it's a place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. Intellectual practices, historical practices, cultural practices. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that anymore. Welcome all around the world. Come and see and talk about it. What time is it now? Uh, can you help? Started out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Theater for everybody, yes, to everybody. That's what we do. That's what we do. And indeed, my understanding of life relationships there has already changed. So um, thank you everybody uh, for coming uh, to uh, the third presentation of uh, the place uh, today. And I'm sorry I made you move over here again. Uh, my name is Frank Henschke. I'm the executive director of the Siegel Theatre Center here at the Grand Center CUNY. We do bridge academia and professional theatre, international and American theatre. Now for over 10 years we have been partner of this really great, great literary festival, Penmore Voices, a uh, festival that really um, highlights the work of Penn, which is between literature and also human rights. Uh, um, activities. Uh, we look up to that organization. It's, a, I think, a leading one, and it's a great, great, great privilege for us to be um, part of it. Um, we already heard, you know, places, and uh, we already heard plays yesterday and today from Australia, the Ukraine, Turkey, Brazil, Guinea, and today we're going to hear uh, voices that come from Berlin, and uh, with us is Sasha Marianne Salzman, who also flew in. <laughs> to be here with us as, you know, Patricia, who came from Australia, and uh, where are the other writers from, t from Turkey, from Brazil, Marcia, and, and everybody. So again, thank you for coming. It means the world um, um, to us. Um, I'm going to move very fast. Uh, the uh, translation was done by Jenny Peening and Mallory Catlett. Mallory, he was here, has been a good friend of the Siegel Center, directed uh, this reading, and we have a spectacular cast uh, here tonight, so I think you're in really for a treat. So thank you uh, for coming. We will have a discussion um, afterwards uh, uh, with Antje Ögel, who is also my co-curator here of the uh, festival. And she will speak uh, with Sasha and the actors and the director. And so there will also be a little reception afterwards outside uh, in the um, archive bar on 36. I will make an announcement uh, afterwards. So if you want to come and join us. And my last thing is if you have a, a cell phone, just take it out for a moment and make sure it's on our little same. So you all did this, yeah? You all had yours out. It, it didn't read, and it did not ring in six readings so far. So uh, I hope it's not this one. So again, thank you all for coming, and uh, there you go. Thank you.
Meteorites by Sasha Saltzman, translated by Jenny Pina. Cast of characters. Cato in a snake pit. Uzum, the uber goddess of the limbo, where everyone is stuck. Udi with Roy. Roy without anything. Serosha with himself. Europa, Europa, Europa. Where was Europa before she turned into the cunt that we know her as today? The dry, vindictive cunt that she is today, where did she come from? Turkey. That's where she was, before she was abducted to Crete. And she wasn't always a cunt. Our good friend Europa used to be a traveler, above all. A princess, carried through the whole of Asia on a sedan chair. And she was a collector. She got slaves to bring to her sedan everything that she encountered on her travels. Put celestial observations and buskins, masks and formulas into the empty bellies of shells, and sewed these into the inside of her robe. The seashells clanked slowly, rhythmically, against the sedan, and brushed against her body. One day, a luminous ball approached her entourage. Its fur shone like a diamond, so that the collector couldn't stop herself from reaching out her hand to touch it. The animal's head was as big as Europa herself. She was so entranced by its luminescence, she was so hypnotized, that she didn't notice that hidden behind the disguise of the animal was the highest of all gods, Zeus himself. Her hand was magically drawn to the fur. Hardly had her fingers touched the silky hair than she pulled them back in fright, only to then sink them back into the fur, as if pulled by an invisible thread. Europa stepped out of her sedan and sat on the bull's back. Carefully, Zeus crept away, sure of having captured his prey. Taking small steps at first, then faster and faster, he fled with the virgin on his back. She cried out bitterly as she came to her senses, but did not let go of the bull's horns for fear of falling and breaking into a thousand pieces. Inside her robe, the items of her collection clacked in rhythm to the movements of the bull's hips and cut into her skin. Unsure of where to bring his prey, Zeus jumped with the weeping Europa into the water. With blood-red eyeballs, he carried her to a distant land where he raped her and beat her and begat her children, whom she hated, but did not kill because she didn't want to get her hands dirty. And she cursed everything that she gave birth to and that came from the gods. She had to give up all the shells in her robe so that she would forget where she came from and that she already had a history. She was searched, all her orifices were examined, and she knew no more shame. The contents of her shells were scattered in all directions, so that Europa, empty, with no memory, went mad. She invented her own god that only believed in itself and denied the existence of all other gods. Several times a day she fell to her knees and prayed to her invented god and asked him to destroy all those who had done her wrong and to inflict war and diseases upon them. She hallucinated in this way, broken inside into a thousand pieces, until she became a barren stone that nobody wanted anymore. I find it disturbing, the way they scream. I think it's cool. Can you turn it down a bit? We'll make it into the final. Then you see. I can hardly wait. Germany's new summer fairy tale. My parents once took me to have my face painted at a street fair. I wanted to be a tiger. The woman with the face paint painted on these whiskers here and here. And when my parents wanted to clean the face paint off in the evening, the color came off, but the whiskers underneath remained as red stripes. There was something in the paint. I had an allergic reaction to it, and well, anyway, I ran around for quite a while with those stripes on my face. Couldn't get them off. Uh huh. I'd be careful about what you smear on your face. You never know. It's organic face paint. They make sure that it's skin friendly. Sure, of course. <laughs> Another one? Imagine if you tried washing this flag off your face and it wouldn't come off. I get it. I don't think so. It must be awful. What? Does it remind you of something? All that screaming and stuff? How ridiculous you all are. Doesn't it turn you on? The way they're running? I'd rather watch a proper porn movie. 
You can be part of something. Be part of a porn movie, you mean? Refugees are really hard work. <laughs> Who are you calling a refugee? If you're depressed, get treatment. There are therapists for that. Really good techniques and everything. I didn't flee. But left. To go on holiday. To study. And then you just stay. Yes. For love. Something like that. So you're a kind of migrant for love. <laughs> Sounds better than a war refugee. <laughs> I landed here. How do you say it? Arrived. I just came without a plan. No, you have a plan. <coughs> so it would seem? You don't have one. Yes, 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 to save the world. My great grandmother cursed my grandmother for going to Germany. And my grandmother broke her back for Germany, pumped her lungs full of chemicals, and loved her daughter to death. She was very proud, this grandmother. She told me you came here for a good life. So, live it, damn it. Don't be humble. I find it embarrassing to act as if I was here for nobler reasons. Migrant worker and war refugee. Both want a better life. But one is forced into it. The other two? Torture. So we only feel compassion for those who are tortured? Yes, so not for me. Nor for me. Well then, we're both welcome. Was it worth it? What? For love. It's an excuse like any other. I see. We're having a good time. Oh dear. <laughs> you know that feeling where someone is so there that you have the feeling you're never alone? That you couldn't think a single thought alone without that person being a part of it? It feels as if every room, every centimeter is full of that person. And you love that person, sure, as far as I'm concerned. But you're so happy when it's quiet in your head, when that person's smell isn't in your nose. Then you're just not in love. Maybe I'll just go back. Join the army of God. Did you know that Isis is the goddess of birth and of magic, the protector of all who suffer? It means nothing to me. What does it? I'd rather watch the match. Outside, a war is raging, and here it's so peaceful. The live screening is outside, and I'm sitting here with you. If you want to go outside, I can keep an eye on things here. Well, I like being here. The guests drink and the dance and the shag <coughs> in the toilets, and I'm there. <coughs> you know, what's the uber goddess called? What uber goddess? In that book that you're reading. Hera. Exactly. I'm the Hera of this limbo. We watch football together, and anybody supporting the wrong team gets thrown out. You don't want more? Children. Yes, children. Forgotten already? No, how could I? Have you changed your mind? What happens if they support the wrong football team? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a question of upbringing. <laughs> I want children and a woman by my side, and I want her to be there all the time, in my head and in my nose. And I want to be with her all the time. I like having someone around, <coughs> lots of people. She and the children on Sunday afternoons, so that I'm never alone. And I like that she's thinking of me all the time, no matter what she's doing, buying bread or tying the children's shoelaces and that I worry because I can't smell her. That sounds really lonely. I look at a photo of her, and then I have to look away because it hurts my eyes because she's so beautiful. Do you know that feeling? Nothing can go wrong anymore? I'm proud of us. We've got a great plan, pioneers. Aren't you proud? And thank you for giving me the strength. Yes. If I didn't know that I had you, I wouldn't do it. Aha. Uh -huh. You're looking at me as if I'd said that before. No, I... You know, I just don't know what you mean. What don't you understand? 
Just say what you want to say to me. Which is? It isn't that my breasts look great in this new push-up. Well, they do. Yes, they do. But that's not what you wanted to say. Nothing will change for us. Your voice will break. You'll never be able to sing again. Could be. I don't know yet. And your skin. Yes. And your bones. And your smell. Will all break. Yes. Don't joke about it. <clears throat> Sorry. How shall we tell the boys? To start with, we shouldn't tell them anything. Don't you think they'll notice that you're growing a beard? Maybe they'll be pleased. Is that it? Do you want to be attractive to men? I want to find myself attractive. Do you want to get away from me? You're not listening to me. We have an arrangement. What about that? It's not possible now. Don't leave me. I'm not leaving you. Of course you're leaving me. We had an agreement. We promised each other something. I need to do it now. <coughs> Otherwise, I'll have to leave you all if I don't do it now. <coughs> Why are you crying? You're not taking me seriously. It's hard for me to take you seriously right now with your face pink. Don't leave me. Get your hands off me. Don't take this away from Get me. Get off. Put it between my legs and tell me why everything has to change. Stop crying. You look ugly when you cry. Sorry, I just want to say, I think it's good. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. It was just, it's just uh, that I was scared that you want to leave me. Come here. Stop crying. No. Come here. I'm going to get your blouse full of paint, face paint. Then stop crying. I'll do anything. You can't. I have to do this. Uh, I might. Am I interrupting? What does it look like? I'll be with you in a sec. What's with all the tears? He should go away. He should go away. Oh dear. Piss off! <laughs> you got something on your face. Then don't look. Oh, hold still. Get off of me. I can't get rid of that. Are you crazy grabbing my face like that? Oh, what's that? Now, Kato, now you've got dirt on your blouse. It's face paint. It'll wash <coughs> off. It's disgusting. Look. Leave it. Did you watch the opening match in that uh, get up? I don't have to justify myself. <coughs> Come on. I'm just wondering why somebody like you would want a flag on your face. Someone like me? We're going now. Well, hang on. Wait. What? Let's what? sweep that look. Are you trying to look like you belong? You're the one who's trying. Seriosha, can you? Do I have to have a face Nazi like you tell me who belongs and who doesn't? I don't have to tell you. But I'd like to know what your friends running around with the same flag see in you. One of them or a clown? I don't care what pricks like you. <laughs> your entire getup is proof of the fact that you don't care what others think. What's he doing here? Great cleavage, shouldn't you put a flag on your breast too? There's enough room. I haven't got round to what? I'll tell you another time. Are you taking the piss? Kato is flying with me to my father's funeral. There, now you know. Can we? Uh, what do you mean? Seriosha, wait. What? You're, you're I wanted going. to. I need to go with him. What? Need to go with him to. It's important. Yes. No. Now I ought to also wipe off my garb on someone else's blouse. <laughs> I need to fly to that fucking country from where I don't know if I'll be able to return. No. <laughs> You're not coming back. Of course I'm coming back. To me. I'm coming back. Does he know? Does he know about your plan? Do I know about what? I'm coming back and... and I hope you both Snuff it in that shithole of a country, in that piss hole. Fine. A great big heap of shit. Crap, really high. <laughs> and it falls apart in the lumps roll across Europe. We agree on that point. <laughs> Take her with you. Hem. He. Please. Hem. You tip out 20,000 square meters of concrete next to the Brandenburg Gate, plant little trees around the edge, and add some ambient sound so that everyone knows. Here, you have to be depressed. Be sad. Remember the dip. Something like that. And they just go in, 
take off their t-shirt, and show off their muscles to the camera. Yeah, and? It shows you that it isn't a place where people want to remember their grandparents who were gassed. It's a place for the Nazi grandchildren so that they can pat themselves on the back for having overcome everything so well because gays can have photos taken of themselves in the Holocaust Memorial for Gay Romeo which bleached with bleached teeth and a bleached asshole. What? Don't you think it's bad? I'm not in the mood for these kind of stories. How come they're getting on your nerves? Your eyes are glazed. That's because of the light. You can't work like that. I can work better like this. It's a turn off. But I'm stoned. It's not good for you in that quantity. I had another look through some ads. I think we should forget about the center of town and look around the north, beyond the s -Bahn. I know you're not a fan, but the area is changing, really. Sure, I'll buy myself a pair of sprinting shoes to go with the new flat so that I can run fast enough when the neighbors come over with baseball bats. <laughs> Don't be so bigoted. Being gay isn't what it used to be. And having black curly hair in an area like that is still the same as what it was. Have you seen how they're reacting to the war? Jew, Jew, coward, pig, come outside and fight alone. Yeah. And you want to go there? It's things like that everywhere. Should I emigrate? I don't know what you should do. I'm not moving to the north. Shall we go somewhere together? Where? Berlin. Sure. You're impossible to please. Here they're too gay. They're too homophobic. Over there, too racist. And they're too Arab. Then leave me be. This phone isn't good for you. You keep hearing about how gays are being harassed, and then you don't want to move anywhere with me. Would it be better if nobody did the job? I notice it with myself. You know, I watch the news today, and I can't get it out. Not just out of my head. Out of my body. They keep advancing, and I think, don't you also have violent fantasy? I mean, torture fantasies? When you see them? The soldiers. That's me on TV. Don't you get it? I see myself there, driving a tank. Walking through the desert in that dirt. You don't see any uniforms anymore, just browny green sand from your neck to your feet. I look like that, you know? That's me. Been a young boy, he can't be more than 18 years old. Stretches his hand out of the tank and makes a victory sign and laughs with crooked teeth from one side of his helmet to the other. And his pupils are so big big as his eyes. I imagine standing behind him in the tank, holding on to his hip bones, and he would shout, Eh, Ritz, Israel, our home. We are defending the Jews' right to exist. And I would bang him until I come in him while he's shouting like that. That's sick. Mm. You're sick. Oh, come on, don't you ever think of things like that? No. <laughs> Say it. Everyone has, you know, ideas like Leave that. me alone. You can say it. Leave me alone. It wouldn't shock me, though. I have a feeling we shouldn't do anything today. Do you know why I smoke so much? Because you're addicted. Because <laughs> I'm sad. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> when you go, I'll be even sadder, and then I'll smoke even more, and then the police will come and arrest me and see that my papers have expired, and then you'll never see me again. Do you want that? <laughs> or I'll bring the police to your place, and they'll see that your papers aren't quite up to date either, and then they'll send us both back, and we can wave to each other from one wall to another. Are you threatening me? Don't you want to ask why I'm sad? Go to the Holocaust Memorial, take off your t-shirt, and see if someone comes. Shall I? And show your ass to the Nazi grandchildren. Are you pissed off with me because I'm smoking? Threatening me with the police is all I need. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, screw you. I love you. I like to screw you. Shut up. <laughs> you know, you, you look fantastic today. <laughs> <laughs> and you're sweating. You, when you smoke too much, you sweat. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a dumb, strung out junkie and deliriously happy with you. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> That's honest. If they see us fighting, <coughs> they won't take the bait. On the contrary, they'll think, cool, Arab studs who want to get off with each other. Can't see the Europe of those. Turks. They'll think we're Turks. Even better. <laughs> slap me in the face. Come on, slap me in the face. <laughs> Come on, slap me in the face. <laughs> You 
have to go. <clears throat> yeah, and what if they throw me in the slam? I'll bring you cheese sandwiches. You come and visit me. Why would you go to prison? Because I'm a cowardly motherfucking deserter <laughs> who's coming to spit on his father's <coughs> grave and is arrested because he's a deserter. And everyone knows what happens to deserters in this country. <coughs> I mean, it, it would be nice if you came by briefly before they screw me, skewer me on a broomstick. Yeah, come on. Don't ham it up. His whole life, that old Kaja only caused problems. You make things problematic for each other. Kato, why won't anyone tell me what he died of? Because they don't know. The fuck they don't know. We don't live in an age in which you don't know something like that. You do an autopsy, cut open his skull cap, weigh his guts, and write in the file, died of... Then go there and do it yourself. I saw it on TV. It's not like on TV over there. Everything is like on TV. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're right, and the whole world doesn't have a clue. He died of AIDS. Did they announce that on TV? And that's why they're not telling me, because he died of AIDS. Some of his teeth fell out. What's that got to do with it? Exactly. Think about it. His immune system collapsed. Did they say that? Did someone tell you that? No. So what are you talking about? I know it. It's really easy to find out. You can't cover it up. In Russia? <laughs> I paid 35 for my driving license. If I said I wanted to work as a doctor, they would have added a doctor's certificate for free. Why should they hide something <laughs> like that? <clears throat> okay, but... Exactly. That's bullshit. It's not. I don't know if you're suffering from grief or something, but maybe you should talk about it with someone, someone professional, I mean. High-ranking officers in the Russian army don't have AIDS. And even if he did, what difference would it make? That everyone in, my, in the family knows except me. We'll fly there now. Yes, exactly, the two of us. How do you picture it? Hey, granddad, by the way, was your son a faggot? Why <coughs> faggot? Oh, don't take it seriously. <coughs> I don't mean it like that. So what do you mean? I need your help right now, and not for you to get hung up on my choice of words. Take me with you. I'll look after you. You don't really believe that, do you? Do you really want to? Yes. I don't want to go alone. I really want to. I don't want to go. I'm coming with you. And the passport controls. Don't let me in. You've got a different name in your passport. I'll travel under that name. You're not allowed to drive. You, you know, it's forbidden for people like you. I don't have to drive a car. Right, you'll live longer. You see, they, they even prevent people from driving a car. Oh well, the way you drive at least might prolong your life. What are you afraid of? How long will it take with your voice and stuff? My voice and stuff? I need to know how to introduce you to my family and what I should tell them about you. I mean, you could still come as my wife a woman like you. What do you mean, a woman like me? Well, they would just think that's the way it is in the West, that women look that way. <laughs> I'll introduce myself to your family, and then I'll ask, hey, hello, do you happen to know whether this prick who we're burying today died of AIDS? I know there is no AIDS here. That's a Western gay person with disease, and Russian officers are completely immune to it, but sometimes there are exceptions. And so I wanted to ask if you happen to know if, because you know my good friend Seriosha, we're just friends, wants to know if his father, although it's neither here nor there, dead is dead, but we all want to know why we're sitting <coughs> on his grave, because he was a mass murderer or a faggot. Stop it. You should know I'm also a faggot. You can say it to my face, because you think I'm a woman, but you're wrong. I'm a woman like me, so a gay man. And I guess Seriosha is too when he fucks me. I don't want you to talk like that. Your father was a dirty rat who slipped open women and raped children. It's very likely that he had all kinds of diseases, if not from women and children, then from the drugs that they injected in order to cope. Shut the fuck up. And I think now you should go there and tell him that you're a faggot, because the Russians are right. It's an infectious disease. It proliferates and it's hereditary. And I'll come with you and tell everyone that we're planning on having children. I won't let you go alone. Do you understand? Nice phone. Thanks. Don't worry, I'm not gonna nick it. Well, thanks for telling me. Yeah, it's what some people think. Why? Why not? Because I have black hair. 
for because you're standing a bit too close to it. What are you drinking? White Russian. Sweet. And you? Water. Sexy. Mm. <laughs> I'm the fox. Oh dear. The wolf and the fox break into the farmer's cellar storeroom. They eat and eat until they're stuffed, and the fox keeps going to the window to check that he can still fit through it, that he can still escape. And the wolf eats and eats. And then the farmer comes. With his shotgun and turns the wolf into a rod, and the fox escapes. I need to keep checking that I can still get out. You're investing in the wrong one. Is this the stock market? I'm not you. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not like that either. I'm not looking for adventure. And there isn't a bored housewife sitting at home waiting for me. We're just talking. All right, we're just talking. <laughs> Why are you so anxious? In your case, isn't it always about who reinvests, how much, <coughs> in whom, and whether it's worth it in the end? So the stock market, after all. <laughs> Instinct. My. Instinct tells me that you want to dance with me. That's sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I work. At the sexual harassment? At the gay harassment hotline. Oh, I'm not. Then I would ask you, are you male? Are you gay? In what way were you harassed? And there's a guy who won't leave me alone. Is he molesting you? Kind of, yes. Is he getting too close to you? Yes. Do you like that? Gone in a half an hour. Gone where? To the airport. That's why you got the suitcase? Where are you flying to? That's a good ploy. Mm -hmm. I've never come across that one with a suitcase in the bar and saying, I'm about to go to the airport. It's good. I like it. <laughs> I'll have one drink and then I'll go. Are you on the run? I have to go to a funeral. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Are you flying alone? Yes. Nobody should go to something like that alone. Do you want to come? Yes. Where are you taking? I'm going now. You don't look like it. You don't look like someone who's going. What do I look like? You look like someone who wants to talk. Can you just leave me alone? Would that be possible? <laughs> <laughs> I can, but you don't want me to. I can see it in your eyes. Are you going to come out with that, uh, your father must have been a thief speech? I don't know. How's it going? Yeah, your father must have been a thief. <laughs> your eyes are stars. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, <laughs> before that, there's something about stealing stars from the sky. That's <laughs> really bad. Yeah, and what do you see in my eyes? Fear. I see. Uh, did you prefer stars? I think so. <laughs> They're very beautiful. You know that? I don't think you do, no. You don't look like someone who knows what he looks like. You want to hear something about your eyes? They are the loneliest eyes that I've ever seen. And I find that very attractive. <laughs> and you're afraid. And that also looks beautiful on you. And I like the way you smell. Okay, that's bullshit. Leave it. <laughs> Stay here. <laughs> what? Stay here. Come with me. Nobody will notice. I need to go to a uh, funeral. The deceased will forgive you. <laughs> I can't. I've got a boyfriend. No. A girlfriend. Yes, it's complicated. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> Chaos was used to being misjudged by everyone. It didn't matter who made assumptions about him. Hardly anybody dared to get really close to him, but he didn't care because he had a calm nature and knew more than others. Most of all, he liked to smoke a relaxing hookah with his best friend, Cosmos, who always contradicted him and tried to convince him of his laws of nature. Chaos smiled softly and darkly into himself and let Cosmos have his way as he gave his self-placating monologues about the principles of gravity and weightlessness while Chaos devoured him with his dark eyes. And Chaos was fertile. He gave birth to Gaia, Nyx, 
Erebos, Tartarus, and Eros, love. He took tender care of his offspring and stroked each of their heads before they went to sleep. But love did not want to share the heart of chaos with her siblings. Secretly, she was jealous of every touch that was not given to her. It seemed to her as if her siblings were always rocked to sleep for longer and hugged more tightly. She started to always fall from the swing and crawl with cut lips into Chaos's lap so that he would comfort her. She broke all her bones and lay in front of her parent with dislocated limbs so that he would only hear her screams, only sing to her. But Chaos saw through the child and did not treat her differently from her siblings. So one day, Love ran away from home, and now acknowledged Cosmos as her parent. With him, she was his only child. She could establish and dictate the rule, and dream of remaining his only offspring. Cosmos took in the angry child with the broken bones, and took care of it according to all the rules of gravity. But the more Love denied her origins, the more crookedly her, bro her bones grew together. The paler and more angry and helpless her face became, the harder to comb was her hair. She no longer washed. The foam from her cut lips had dried into a scab. Half crippled and stinking, she hobbled back and forth between the house of her parent Chaos and her new home with Cosmos, not knowing what she wanted, apart from controlling everyone she met. She threw herself on her victims, gnawed the skin from their bones, whispered and spat laws about gravity and weightlessness into their ears that she didn't believe in herself and ran off as soon as she recognized herself in her victim's eyes. Her weight squashed the bones of those who she threw to the ground, and they could not get up again for a long time. They lay for ages with trampled limbs, always with the memory of the greedy, jealous beast and the deep bite marks that she had left behind. Plane ticket, passport, he had a cute ass. <laughs> yeah, and a few hundred dicks have been in that ass. We can still do something with the passport. Don't you think he was cute? Have you fallen for him? You're the only man in my Just life. Ah, let go, you're slippery. But you like that. The way you danced up to him, I thought you wanted him for yourself. How? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> and how else? Like this. <laughs> suck me. Do it yourself, I'm wrong. And I'll suck you. Can you get your hands off me? I want to count. Ah, ah, that hurts. You're totally contorted. Ow! Relax. Shit, what's that? Don't move. Is it lumbago? Mm. You're getting to that age. Could you please be more careful? Breathe. Ah, it hurts. I lie, I lie down for you, with you, for a minute. You smell different. Do I stink? Good. You smell good. That must be enough. Not by a long shot. At some point it has to be enough. At some point we'll open the casket and it will emit a gleaming light. Golden. And we'll have dollar signs in our eyes. No, euro signs. Enough for at least five rooms. A maisonette. Or a loft with a roof terrace in the center of town. We've never talked about how many rooms you want. Do you know already? I only want one. You can have all the others. Actually, I don't want any rooms without you. I don't want anything without you. I want you to spread yourself out of all of the rooms. And I'll tidy up your things in order to find mine. I'd like that. To shout at you because your dirty socks are lying on my computer. Shit, it really hurts. I want us to choose everything together. Tiles for the bathroom, king-size beds with mirrors on the left wall. On the right, a blacked out window so that we can stand in front of it naked and stick our naked asses on the backyard without anybody seeing anything. That would be expensive. Ow! I want you to get lots of those plants that you're always talking about so that you can water them and take care of them properly. And at some point, I'll ruin it all. <laughs> get them muddled up and drown them because I gave them too much water and because I was so nervous because you gave me responsibility for your favorite living thing. But deep down, I'll probably just be jealous and hate them. Too much water and sugar. <laughs> and you cook the food, and I'll grumble that I want to eat out. And we lie in bed till evening, and you'll read to me, and we'll fuck, and won't do anything else. Can you wait a minute? Soon we must have enough. We'll fuck lots of boys. 
And when we're through with it, all, with all the boys in the city, we'll start on all of these. We'll go out to old people's homes. Would that disgust you? <laughs> it would me, but I would do it for you. <laughs> Can we talk? And then the tourists, don't forget the tourists. Every year so many come to the city, by now we really ought to have the money together. We're too lazy, we could have been more productive. How much have we got already? I don't know. 50? Less. 40? Less. 30? Less. <laughs> Bullshit. Less. <laughs> you know what? If that's the case, then we'll just have a few more years in this hole. I'm going to go and count again. Something's wrong. It's, it's much too little. I took some of it out. What do you mean you took some of it out? For what? My share. Why are you taking any out? We made a deal. Not to touch this money, it's, it's for the flat. Not anymore. If you need someone, something, you don't have to take it secretly, you can tell me. I can't go on like this. How much did you take? Half. Give it back. It's mine. No, it's ours. Give it back. It's for the flat. I'm moving out. No, you're not. I don't believe you. It's annoying. It's annoying? Did you really just say it's annoying? Did you really use that word? We can carry on earning money together, but I need room for me. What kind of a shit room? You wanted to buy a flat and tell our children that we earned how we earned the money to buy it. We made an arrangement with the girls. One for them, one for us. We can't break that deal. Kato has started taking hormones. He'll be a he. What's that got to do with? That's. What does that mean? It means he's dropping out. Why? He can't have children anymore. What does that have to do with us? Then we'll have them with someone else. He'll be what he is. He's doing it now. Doesn't give a shit about anyone. About any arrangements. And isn't scared of losing everything. All of us. He's just doing it. I'm going now. But you can't go. You've got the bubble. Sit back down. We'll never save enough for the flat. Where do you get that idea? How do you know that? It's just not enough. It'll never be enough. What will never be enough? We don't have a future. It won't work. With me? With me. Is it because of Kato? I can talk to him. Him. Talk to him. And you can't talk to him. He's leaving, and so am I. You're an absolute shit to leave me like that. I'm a fox. I need to check that I can still get through the window. You cripple. Look at yourself. What do you have, apart from me? Nothing. That's okay. Can I carry that? Is that okay? You... Yes, you look... really good in that. Will you help me with the cufflinks? Let's sit down a minute. Is something the matter? Yes. What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? Here. What is that? Someone gave to me as a present. Just like that? Keep it. It's for you. Where did you get it? I'm walking along the street, and behind me is this old woman. And she holds out this ring to me and says, Excuse me, I think this is yours. You just dropped it. And I look at it, and of course, I didn't drop it. But I liked it. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd take it. Did you give the woman money for it? <laughs> I think it's made of gold. How much did you give her? Why? Just curious. Ten. Why? <laughs> Why are you laughing? You're easy to con. What do you mean? Well, if you don't want it, you don't want it. Uh, it's very beautiful, thank you. I want to keep it. No, stop laughing. It's <coughs> kind of expensive. <coughs> I've met so many of these women who find a ring. Young man, young man, is it yours? You just dropped it. Such a beautiful ring. You don't want to lose a ring like this. And you know how they earn their money. Because nobody tells the truth. That's not my ring, but thank you. Shit. <laughs> I'm sure she needs the money. Never trust anybody. Don't think you're cleverer than others. I got done with that money, too. It was my last penny. I had it in my trouser pocket. Mm -hmm. Do you need money? My wallet is gone. What do you mean your wallet is gone? Stolen. What? Will you marry her? What? 
Yeah, what, what? Will you marry me? Right. Can you stop that? What do you mean? Here's a ring. Yes. Let's get married. <laughs> Say something, anything. I feel dizzy. Nothing is clear, nothing and nobody. The floor is swaying. I want it to stop. You want what to stop? I need something to be stable. And that would be me? My knees are shaking. My knees are shaking and my skin is itching here on my neck. Can you see? I'm getting a rash. I want it to stop. And why do you want to marry me? It occurred to me when I saw this ring. I thought this pretty gold ring would look great on Kato's finger. Kato's slim finger. And? I watched recordings of these meteor showers near Chirales. It must have looked like Armageddon, burning stones falling from the sky. It must have been so light. All the car cameras recorded it. I watched one recording, burning clumps of stone hailing down onto Earth, and this guy placidly driving along the road. And when a meteorite whizzes past really close to his car, <coughs> he just closes the sunroof. That's it. His expression doesn't change. Eyes right ahead. He doesn't flinch. If a meteorite it flew past me, well then, sunroof down, keep driving, stay on the road. Yes, and what are you trying to say with that? I wish I was like that. You'd like to be retarded. We're going to fly to this shitty funeral. And when we survive that, we're going to marry. We'll get married there. And I'll introduce you to everyone, and we'll wear a white dress. You'll wear the white dress, I'll wear a white tuxedo, and we'll hire a limousine and drive much too fast through the city center. We'll throw out the chauffeur at a traffic light, and I'll drive you, you'll sit on my lap, I won't be able to see the road anymore because there will be white tool everywhere, but that doesn't matter. I'll stay on the road, and you'll kiss my neck when the rash is gone, and laugh in my ear. Don't you want to do that, though? <laughs> Tiresias, the blind prophet, was born neither blind nor a prophet, <coughs> nor as a man or a woman. The offspring of a shepherd and a nymph he lived as a priest of the mighty Zeus with an indefinable sexuality until he came across a snake pit and accidentally <coughs> killed a female snake. After this, he became a woman, gave his notice to the highest of all gods, and became the priestess of his wife, Hera. Tiresias married and had children and could have lived happily ever after, but he was tormented by being seen only as one thing, as a woman. And so he went back to the same snake pit and this time took out a male snake and killed it. But instead of being turned back to what he was, or to, instead of being turned back to what he was born as, a combination of everything, he became a man. Distraught that there was no way of going back to his original perfection as a man-woman, the now male being left his children and his husband, <coughs> wandered the earth and told people about his original state, that the division into one or the other signified a perpetual restriction, a crutch, which was the reason why humans never attain happiness and why they told themselves stories of two halves that belonged together and searched for each other. But what they were searching for couldn't be found in the other, and those who believed it were stupid. What they were searching for were the two parts in their own bodies. Those who only saw themselves as one sex were cursed to everlasting incompleteness. The gods were outraged that Tiresias had revealed the secret of all secrets to humans, <coughs> Because as long as humans were searching for one another, they let the gods be and did not bother them themselves with their scheme. But now, the humans were rising up and shaking their fists at the heavens, incensed that the gods had divided them into two sexes in order to be able to control them better. So the gods blinded Tiresias, who continued to wander the earth and tell people what he knew, because he had been born as both. Now, cursed and divided, he learned the language of the birds, and became a prophet in order to continue telling the secret of the gods to humans.
Is that for a funeral or a wedding? I don't know what they wear over there. I've never seen you in a dress. Me neither. That's wrong. I know. Why are you doing that? I just wanted to see if I can fed it first, <coughs> or was all that just to get rid of me? I thought of having a photo taken of me in my dress and sending it to my parents. I was thinking about all those photos of me in which this frazzled kid has to put up with being photographed in pink clothes. They just didn't care that I fought tooth and nail, that I started lashing out when they made me wear skirts. And then they would quickly take a photo and send it to my grandmother, as if to prove I was completely normal. What do you think they'll say? One last photo before they never recognize me again. <coughs> I need to go. Shall we take a photo of the two of us? You and me in dresses? I don't have any time. I have to buy firecrackers. During the last match, they ran out before the end. That was crazy. Not having any firecrackers left after the fourth goal. And then there were another three. The whole neighborhood jerked off too early with excitement. Did you see? No. OK, then. Wait. <coughs> I, are you feeling all right? What? What, what are you doing? I'm trying to buy myself a lipstick. I don't know how long I've been standing in front of the shelf. The whole time I've been trying to work out which one suits me. Can you help me? Why, why are you doing this? Nothing subdued. It is a funeral, after all. Red for sorrow. I'm going to paint my lips red and then flags on my cheeks like you. And then... Yes, and then... Why are you wearing a dirndl, Zoom? One of the players was also wearing one of these. Just like this one. In pink. Why are you wearing a dress? I don't understand. You tell me you're going to be a man, and I can fuck off out of your life. Then I meet you, and you're running around in a dress and want makeup tips. We're going to be in the final. What don't you understand? Isn't it dangerous to wear something like that? They're all drunk and shouting. Do you have any idea how much you wreck? No. I've never been so betrayed. How did I betray you? I don't care what you are. But I do care what I am. I want you just the way you were, in between. I'm not an in-between. And what are you? A faggot in a dress? I'll call you sometime. <laughs> don't. I don't call me. I'm all right. I've been feeling fine. <coughs> Much better since you stopped calling. Really, since I found out what a shit you are, I've been doing great. Please don't call me. I'm starting to forget the sound of your voice. That helps. But uh, your voice will be completely different anyway. Everything about you will be different. Hey, who knows how you'll turn out. But you've certainly got balls. I can't deny that. I'm getting married. Excuse me. Well, yes. You have ridiculous in a dress. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are you getting married at the funeral? <laughs> Do you really believe it? What? That he'll marry you? Someone like me, you mean? Are you getting married as a man? I am a man. If I get married, then as a man. <laughs> Don't you get it? I can wear dresses or suits. I'm sorry if that confuses you, but it's your own body that you can't accept, not mine. Flaunt your breast to the whole football stadium and find a, something out about yourself. Oh, wow. Why am I betraying you all? I'm not you all, I'm me. Why am I always betraying everyone by doing what I am? Why? Do you wanna watch the match with me? Excuse me? Do you want to watch the match with me? You and I will celebrate your engagement with lots of firecrackers. And wearing a dirndl. We'll buy some firecrackers and sit on the roof, watch the match, let off firecrackers and scream. It's really liberating. Honest. <laughs> Join in.
thinking a lot about my grandmother lately. I mean, I, I even talked to her, although she's not here, off my rocker. <coughs> she came here when she was my, my age, and she didn't know anybody. She just ended up here. In those days, there was no internet, Skype, all that shit. She phoned her family in the village once a month. Lived in a home. Sometimes people stood outside with torches and shouted in a language that she didn't understand. She just came here. Learned the language, produced children, and when she knew she'd done what she had to do, she went back, and since then has lived on what she made, all alone. And I think of her and wonder how she knew that, that it was right, because you can only have that much strength if you know that something is really right where you are, where you've ended up, as if you hadn't just ended up somewhere randomly, from one place to the next, as from one person to the next, that nothing is random or futile, absolutely, you know it. You're so sure of it that it's not even an issue, you don't even question it. You simply come, you simply go. You know that where you are is the right place to be even when people are standing outside your door with torches shouting the opposite. I actually only have that feeling when I look at your face. Then I have this strength in me, this feeling of being in the right place. Otherwise I don't, otherwise never. Thanks in here. Yeah, I didn't feel like um, it's disgusting. Didn't I have diabetes? <laughs> no, we don't have any pets. When did you last open the windows? Me, me, no, no idea. I'm, I'm afraid of touching something in case I catch something. <laughs> no joke about my home. It's really dirty here. And ugly. Yeah, great. Okay, can you stop now? No, that's so ugly. I mean, what kind of trash is that? It's is it a gay thing to like things like that? Such obviously ugly things? As tasteless as it's possible to get. <laughs> we bought it together. <coughs> it was expensive. Yeah, man. In an antique shop oh. for the new flat. I thought I thought we moved together in a new flat and then I'll oh, hang it up. Great, now don't start crying. <laughs> I really thought <laughs> Passport! My passport! That's just shit please. for leaving me like that. Get up! What are you doing? My whole body hurts. Hey, I'm not your parent. <laughs> we had plans, you know? We had two girls with whom we wanted to ma make children. Mm. One for them, one for us. It would have been so perfect. Come on, get up. It hurts. Yes, of course, it hurts. Can you hold me for a moment? You want me to do what? Can you hold me? For a moment? No. <laughs> do I stink? No. Please, <coughs> just for, for a minute. I haven't been outside for days. I haven't eaten, and yes, all right, I also haven't showered. And then I go on to the streets to just think of ways to kill myself. And who do I run into in this big city? You. Please, I know it's stupid, but can't you give me a hug? <laughs> then I'll stop crying and talking. And then we'll quickly find your passport and you can go and forget about me as if nothing had happened and I'll kill myself. <laughs> Please. Yes, my passport, if that's all right with you. 
That's how you're looking for his passport. We were just. <laughs> you're the guy from. Yes, the guy from. Why did you bring him here? Oh, thanks for that little dance he the other day. His passport. And so you bring him home with you? His father died. He has to go to the hospital. <laughs> you want me to believe that? He needs help. I need help. You shut up. <laughs> I don't want to get involved. I just want my passport and my money back. And then we can sort it all out without the police and part ways without any I cost. thought you weren't gay. I'm not. Is this your consolation prize? Now you're suddenly jealous? But you were fucking with me. You're doing that to yourself the whole time. <laughs> How long has this been going on? It's not. It's got nothing to do with you. I'm going to call the cops now. This is too ridiculous. You do fuck all, ballerina. Give me my, give me back my phone. Your phone is now my phone. Okay. And now get the hell out of here. I'll show you. Okay, okay. Hey, let each other go. Come on, city, Osha. Okay. I'm going to I said stop. Stop it now. Everywhere people are dying. Moscow, Chitana, Fort Water 15, green hallway, flickering ceiling lights. Sometimes none. These are all the images I have. Does anyone care? The same blood is flowing in your veins as in mine, my boy. Never forget that. What does that mean? Death is flowing through your veins, old man, and through mine. <coughs> They'll arrest me on the spot or drag me to the military straight from the airport in the country with the highest suicide rate in the world. The boys don't brush their teeth for weeks, then scrape off the plaque and inject it into themselves in the hope that their arm will fall off and they can't shoot. Not at the Ukrainians and not at themselves. Only a few survive. Forget it, I can't go there. Yes, and then what? To stand with my hands in my pockets in front of an embalmed doll, waxed like Lenin, so that my uncle can whisper in my ear, hands out of your pocket and stand straight, you stand to attention in front of an officer, for God's sake! So that they can come and stand with me and think they can say something, so that they can smell me, touch me, judge me, this product from the West, our pride and joy. I'm neither your nephew, nor your son, nor a soldier. Get your hands off me. Drink this and I'll put the rest on your wounds. Oh, it hurts. Swallow, don't think. I don't think. Like at home. It's okay. As a child, my parents would rub vodka on me when I had a fever. Well, then your parents did something right. And that's how you turn babies into alcoholics. Not you. <laughs> You're still just sucking at your glass. Hey, what are you doing? Rub it in. It's cold. I'm glad that you came. Thank you for, for taking care of me. I couldn't leave a mutt like you just lying on the street. I wasn't lying. Sure. You were just having a little rest, I know. Is that what you think of me? I don't think anything about you. Do you find me attractive? Listen. No, listen. Do you find me attractive? My tits, my ass? Yes. The way I am? Yes, I find you attractive. I find everything about you attractive. And if it all changes? If I start growing hairs on my chest? Do you want me to cut them off? I'll smell yes. different. I can't right now. Do we have to, can we, can we talk about it one step at a time? Do you love me? What's up with you? When I was a child, they never really rubbed me with anything. When I was in pain or made me tea, I did it myself. When I was five, I already knew how to make a tea for an upset stomach. By the age of 12, how to use a condom. I told my mother I'm not a virgin anymore, and she looked at me like, congratulations. And now what? When blood came out of me, I didn't dare tell anybody about it. 
I thought my body was playing a joke on me. This can't be, it will stop. Finally, the bleeding, the doctor told me. They tell you so many things, they keep trying to persuade you the whole time. I hate going to this therapist. I have to go over and over everything and act as if I'm suffering. I'm not, I'm not suffering. I'm very happy. I'm really optimistic. About us? I was at your Zooms again. Oh. I just thought I should tell you. What do you mean you thought you should tell me? I met her in a shop. And? Well. So you felt sorry for her? Let me. Right there in the shop? No. What do you want to tell me? I want everything to be out in the open when we go to the funeral. I don't want there to be anything between us. I see. I always want to be truthful with you. That's why I'm telling you. Always the truth. Yeah. All right, the truth. How nice. And what is the truth? The truth is, everything is going to turn out great. Why? How do you know? Because I know. Because? Because you see me for what I am, and I see you for what you are, and it works. Always the truth. Please don't look at me like that. I'm going alone. No, wait. Here's your truth. I'm going on my own. No, I'm coming with you. You're not invited. Now, hang on a minute. The thing with the movie <coughs> doesn't mean anything. Yes. What kind of a bad person are you to say something like that? You fuck a woman who would kill for you, and so that I don't get angry, you even say it didn't mean anything. Or did it really not mean anything? You're a little disgusting. Serial shot. I find your face nauseating. Have you looked in the mirror lately? Sometimes it just melts. Have you noticed when you pull that face like the one you're pulling now, then your eyes flow apart, you look retarded. Ugh! Wait, please wait. I've never punched someone in the face, but with your mug, sometimes when you start to quiver, I just want to punch you. Don't touch me. I'm not touching you, I find you hideous. You think it's because of Uzum? But I'm as turned off by that whore as I am by you. Fuck whomever you want. I wanted to leave ages ago. I should have done it. That's the truth. Here it is. When I imagined taking me with you, I wanted to get out of here on the next flight. And then some faggot steal my ticket and my passport and I'm stuck here with you. What are you doing here? Who told you you could be here? It's my flat. Piss off! Leave! You already had a ticket? I had a ticket, just for me. I just went to a bar for a quick drink. Then these blackheads pulled one on me. Twice. Fucking illegal immigrants. I got it back, my passport. I don't want to see you anymore, your face. It's changing as if there's something under your skin that's crawling apart. Ow, oh, that hurts. Stay still, otherwise you'll be running around with those bruises for a while. Or at least put a towel around it. Yes. It's nice to hear you laugh. Yeah. Nice to laugh again. What do you no, do? let's not do that. We're not doing anything. You're pressing a load of ice on my face and hoping that I choke. Yes. I can't feel my nose anymore. Mm, but maybe it's broken. What kind of guys do you pick up? What do you mean, pick up? I really thought you were fucking. Fuck off. <coughs> a psychopath. Yeah, I find it sexy that you beat someone up for me. I didn't. I'm still doing that image. I didn't pick him up to- Ow! What did I press too hard? If it wasn't already broken, it is now. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I missed your voice. I did. Even if it's unimportant. I'm probably not allowed to say this. <coughs> How are you? I mean, stupid question, but seriously? Mm -hmm. I love you. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you stay with me, I'll do everything. What do you want to do? Just lie like that, I'll hold you, and you lie back. And when my nose has healed, you'll break it again. Why did you come back here if not to work things out? I'm going in a minute. What? Lying on the pavement. On the pavement. Really? I thought I'd drop by. 
to see how you are. Not true. I was scared on the street. Mm -hmm. Stupid, yes, but I ran through the street and suddenly I had this feeling that it isn't safe. And you came here. You always loved me so much. I thought you didn't need me. I couldn't want to leave you, be standoffish, and you still cope. You simply love me. No, I don't. I don't cope. How's your back? It wasn't lumbago. It was my jaw. I was at the dentist. He said if I don't stop grinding my teeth, my spine will snap. I tense up my jaw muscles so much, it spreads <laughs> everywhere else. If I carry on like that, then I won't be able to walk anymore in a year, and my spine will split in two. And then he asked me if it has to do with my, where I come from. And I didn't understand what he meant, and just looked at him. I'm lying on his dentist's chair, practically upside down, with this white bib around my neck, and him with his mouth guard. I just didn't understand if he was really asking me that, or something completely different. And then he says it again really slowly and loud, whether it has something to do with my native country that I tense my jaw so much. And when I still don't move, he repeats the question in English, although we've been speaking in German the whole time. And then he says he's spoken about it with these colleagues. Some of them have patients from that country. It must be awful. What a state of affairs. And sticks this huge instrument down my throat. And I have to puke, gag reflex. I was sick all over myself. Did you know that jaw muscle is the strongest muscle in the whole body? No, me neither. What can be so bad that you don't want me anymore? I'm gonna go, Udi. I can't stay here. With me. I came here to tell you that, I think. Whenever I see your face, I forget it. And, and when you go, do you know where? Where is, where is better? It's not about better. There's a funny atmosphere at the moment. Yes. On the streets. I don't like that screaming. They're happy. It doesn't look like it. It looks like they're snarling. You look like that too when you come. Yes. They're all having an orgasm. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? We're in the fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Very well. Seriously. And you? How are you? I don't feel like having this conversation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can I stay here for a bit? Yes. May I? You know what bothers me? You don't say, can I be with you for a bit? You, you say, can I stay here for a bit? Like, I'm just something where you can be when he throws you out. He didn't throw me out. He has to think over a few things. He's going through a difficult... Why don't you fly with him? I'm not flying because... His decision or yours? Morning phase, probably. Did you tell him about us? That's irrelevant. I feel how my bones are growing. It's a strange feeling. My skin is becoming rougher here on the chin and also the shoulders. Have you noticed? Here. The doctors say that's the way it should be, but don't want to get don't want me to get dressed in front of them. They're afraid of touching me. The average age of people like me is 23. The probability of long-term relationships is nobody tells you that it has to do with the fact that you are what you are. Well, some tell you, but with them it's fast, almost painless. It's much worse with the ones who don't say it. Do you still want to have children? What? Do you want to have children? You wanted them really badly. Yes, not with you. I understand. Were you about to offer me some? No. <laughs> Why bang on about it, right? That nobody wants you? Yes. You can understand that. You of all people can understand. Yes, probably. What it means not to be wanted. <coughs> it's strange that you haven't got a clue. Or, or don't you want to have a clue? How much you're hurting me? What's your problem with women? Is it some kind of revenge? Why have I? You'll be a real man. Only a man can be that egotistical. Not noticing what's going on around you. 
Are you also going to have a dick sewn on? Zoom, wait. You don't I care that we fuck. You don't care where you stay. If, you're, if, you're, if your mate throws you out, you don't care about anything. You don't care about me. You don't care about women. You're turning away from us. Do you think you have to be like that to become a real man? I want you to go. It's not good for me when you're here. I don't know anymore who I am when I look in your face. That was the only thing that ever calmed me. And now you're taking it away from me. You're taking away your face. You're taking away our children. We got a plan, and now you're talking about skin problems. Your face is about to burst with all of those hormones so taut. I'm afraid your eyes are going to pop out. I can't deal with it. It hurts me. Your rough face, everything that you say. It makes me sad to see something like you. I'll be totally honest with you. It's you. Short and sweet, you make me sick. The gods found out that Tiresias could hear them because he understood the language of the birds. And so they sent eagles that were as big as cliffs with sharp talons and beaks out of bronze, and they chased Tiresias across the flat disk of the earth. He had hardly lain down to rest than he heard a wild screeching, and through the beating of their wings, the gods themselves screamed. There was nowhere for Tiresias to hide from them. The birds pecked at him, but they didn't kill him. They only ever ate a piece of his flesh, which then grew back together so that he would feel the pain all over again. Half eaten up, blind, Tiresias pricked his eardrums in the hope that he, in the hope that the gods would forgive him. He crawled on all fours over the fields, smelled the grass, groped at stones, tasted the nectar of the blossom, and for the first time in ages he was happy, because he didn't know anything anymore about gods and humans. Soon he had forgotten them completely, and broke out in a laugh that reached to the furthest cave, where Echo carried it forth, under the earth, to Tartarus. Sounds like an intifada, what they're doing out there. Shut up. Let's drink. Damn, banging. Cheers! I don't want to go home. To us! Yes, to us. Exactly. Thanks. It suits you. Cato gave it to me. Hmm. He only gave me something when he didn't want it himself. Same here. I wish you were dead. Yeah. I want things to be so bad for him that he goes blind. That he dies lonely and abandoned. I wish you were here now. What would you say? I would smash his face. No, probably not. What would you want to say? Stay with me. Come back. Why? Why? Yes, why? Why do people come back? Because of me. Uh -huh. Because we were good together, because he wept in my arms. Everyone does that at some point. You had 
Such a good plan. Yes. Jewish children. Excuse me? Okay. Cato dropped out, but you can still do it. He and I would adopt children, and because one of the fathers is Jewish, so are his children. There are no half-Jews. Anyone can tell you that. If the grandmother of your second cousin had a Jewish cat, then your whole clan is Jewish forever. And that's great. If he and I have children, the world stands a chance. Why not also say Syrian or Turkish? It's got nothing to do with where they came from. Being Jewish is a condition. A chosen one. Chosen one. I think I'm going to take you with me to my place tonight. You're not going to make it to yours anymore. No, I, I, I'm serious. If everyone is Jewish, then everyone's equally fucked up. No differences, no nations. And we could start to hate each other for different reasons. <laughs> Love, for example. And then on the way back to mine, we'll make Jewish children. Can you imagine me with a little thing like that, with a little howler like that, as big as the palm of my hand? I would put him on my shoulder, like a mouse, and he wouldn't sleep there, and mumble in my ear when he's thirsty. Can you imagine that? Very creative. Right. Then let's make it, to mark the occasion, let's make children. This is the right, the only right evening for it. Udi, you're right. Everything is collapsing, falling apart. You're right. But we're not. We're living. We need to celebrate that. Let's make children right now. Now? Yes. Here? On, on the bar? Yes, if you like. <laughs> to hell with them. To hell with all of them. Come on. Wait, what, do you, what do you mean? To hell with them. I mean, if they don't want to join in. Just, just you and me. Why not? Make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. Oh my god. <laughs> so I see. Oh please, oh please not. It will be so much worse than I thought. Can you just pour me a big glass of something? Sure. Are you drinking too? It's on me. It's on you. Anything wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that. Roy's buying us all a drink. Did you watch the match? Thanks, Susan. No, I didn't watch the match. I have to work. But you know already. It's hard not to hear. Are you pleased? It's really great to see you both. What's the matter? Do you feel sick? I can only taste the vodka. <laughs> Would you prefer a glass of water? No, no water. What are you doing here? I... It's a sign. Both of you here today, this evening, with me. <laughs> I think you should both stop this nonsense. Really, you belong together. We all belong together. This is the night. Look outside. How beautiful. Roy, listen, this running away, not running away, is ridiculous. We all want to run away, but nobody does it, right? Listen, Uzu bears our child, as planned, and the three of us will be its parents. Right now, <laughs> joking. <gasps> Sorry. Did he puke? Only vodka is coming out. There are nicer ways of reacting to plans for starting a family. <laughs> 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 I got this phone call, the voice. It was familiar, but also not. It was metallic. It took me so long to work out that I knew it, the voice. I was on the night shift and there weren't many calls. The usual, harassment on the street, groping between the legs, someone got a black eye. Statistics, I asked the usual questions. What did the perpetrators look like? Did they have an immigrant background? And then this voice calls up and at first I thought, a girl, and I said, this is the gay harassment hotline. But she said she's a he, and is being pursued, and I can hear that she's running, this person. And of course, I think I know this person. Only that she sounds different now, tinny. But I know her. And then there are fireworks, and everyone's screaming, and I worry that the line will cut off, but I can still hear it, the voice. And she knows me, calls me by my name. Somebody's shouting in the background. I don't know whether it's in my street or where it's coming from, as if it was all one space. The voice is panting and tries to tell me something while running, but I can't understand anything she says. I say, I'm gonna call the police, tell them where you are, and then I can hear the others getting closer, caterwauling, and the person on the telephone screams, and I can hear how she's being beaten. 
I hang up, hang up and call the police. Tell them I'm calling from the gay harassment hotline that a person called up and screamed, someone needs to come quickly. The address, he didn't tell me where he was. The name, Cato. But that's not his name, not his real name. I don't know his other name. But Nymphus had lost and knew exactly where she had to go. She didn't know why, but she knew she had to. On the bank of the river that she had run to, she met Hermaphroditus, and she sat down next to him in silence. For a while, they looked at the shimmering surface of the water together, and Salmasus took two thin cigarettes out of the breast pocket to the flowing shirt that she was wearing. She put them both between her lips, lighted them, and offered one to Hermaphroditus. They smoked for a while. The water gave off quivering sparks and dazzled them both, so that they kept having to shut their eyes. How long have we been here already? Salmosis asked Hermaphroditus after they had finished their cigarettes. I have a feeling we will be doing this for ages, replied the youth, who, seen in the glinting light of the bright sun, suddenly could have also been an old man. He took off his clothes and went in the water. He didn't turn around, didn't indicate for Salmosis to follow. He went deeper and deeper into the water until it came up to his neck and looked up. He didn't hear Salmosis coming in. As a nymph, she was burdened neither by the earth's gravity nor its slowness. The shirt didn't make any noise either. She had taken everything off and came in naked. Her strong arms and entwined Hermaphroditus' thin neck like a gust of wind. She swirled her tongue around his head like a snake. Her heels clawed at his hip bones. She glided inside him through his skin, melted into him until they were one. And so Hermaphroditus and Salmosis danced as a single body until they disappeared under the surface of the water. And his new body, which was man and woman, Hermaphroditus shone in transcendental perfection. This body carried him against the laws of gravity with the lightness of a nymph. During the midday heat, he usually tried to rest in the shade of the temple of his mother, love. Naked, lying on his stomach, half on his side, folded, his arms under his neck, he, his face turned away from the sun, he fell asleep. One day, some humans sought the shade of the temple at midday. They saw this beautiful being asleep in a sea of fabric and knew that it must be the perfect body that the prophet Tiresias had described before he disappeared. They came closer and looked at him, how his full breasts and his sex rested on the linen, his long hair gathered up in the nape of his neck, the balls of his feet pressed into the fabric so that the cloth enveloped his body in soft waves. They were confused by his body because they knew that it was everything that they could never be that it challenged everything that they did, made a mockery of it. They knew that they would never attain his knowledge, his per perfection. He lay there like a peaceful fissure on the steps of the temple, like a mockery. If he was real, then nothing that the gods had told them was true. If he was real, then they had spent their entire lives chasing after the wrong thing and would do so forevermore. They removed his feet, his thighs up to his knees, then his ribs, they ate his member, they cut off his breasts. Before they broke his lips, Hermaphrodite screamed to his mother. The people were horrified and saw what they had done. They created a sculpture out of marble that was exactly as long as the body of Hermaphrodite when they found him and carried it into the temple. Having been turned into a myth, he could not harm anyone anymore. From this moment on, he was a story. You could find it beautiful, you could mourn it. But the mother of Hermaphrodite loved promised eternal revenge. Spinning vile, she threw herself onto earth, broke into a thousand pieces, and settled herself into every eyeball like a poisonous arrow. Since then, every time you blink, I'm there, and I'm not moving. Scratching her eyeballs from the inside, there's no need to look like that. Hello.
Revolution. I'm sometimes so thank you, Mallory. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna jump right into it. Um, thank you both so much for this amazing presentation here, Mallory for directing it, and Sasha Sackman for writing. Yeah, it is a, yeah. Um, for writing this beautiful play that we had the pleasure to present here today. Um, the play takes place during a very eventful year, in 2014, it was 2014, right? When Germany won the Soccer World Cup and um, I think Ukraine was invaded, right, by Russia. The refugee crisi crisis started in Europe. Um, so there's, in front of that background, there's a lot happening there in these people's lives. Can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration? How did you start writing this book? Um, yeah, my, my world was falling apart that summer, um, which is quite obvious, I guess. Um, yeah, I... Um, Geographic note, I got a Russian and a uh, German passport. And Russia started to fuck Ukraine, and, and I'm Jewish, and Israel was this, again uh, destroying Palestine the same summer. And we had the so-called refugee crisis, which means, like in Berlin, there was like uh, this school uh, occupied by refugees, because they were like, in every country you know about that, like, they were like about to send back, and. There were some guys, they, they hide it on the roof of the school and they said they're gonna jump if the police uh, come and evict. So we were demonstrating in the streets like every night, every, like during the daytime we would like work on plays like that. And it was kind of obvious that if you, if you do art about that, you also go on the demonstrations. Um, and we spent our nights there. And at the same time, uh, my personal world was also collapsing. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with all this involvement. I felt responsible for everything which is wrong in the world, like in Russia and Germany and, and Israel, and everything was so wrong. Um, and as it always is, writing is the only solution for me, like the only way to deal with things. This summer is so important for Europe, but especially important for Germany, I guess. It meant a lot to become a world power again and all those shitty flags all over the streets. Um, and yeah, it, it made a change. The summer really made a change. And since then, people, like it's three years ago, and since then people say that every summer gonna be this summer because the so-called pride is back. Uh, and um, the so-called refugee crisis is increasing. And well, as we know, Ukraine is not really better. I'm not even starting with Israel and Palestine. So yeah, it's kind of like, it's a, maybe a picture of a very hot summer we had. And um, your characters also embody these conflicts, really. So maybe you can also tell a little bit about your use of the different myths that are weaving throughout. Well, it's all also very obvious that I used uh, Ovid's metamorphosis for it. Um, I, I thought of calling it metamorphosis uh, first, then they told me uh, th that's already been done. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that came from different thought. Like, I, I, I wasn't looking for topic or bodies. This is what you've seen. This is my, my chosen family in Berlin. And I, I, I'm, that's the world I see and how we act and how we react to what is going on. They're not like, they look like very like chosen. Oh, we need a Syrian or an Israeli guy. But actually, I was not really looking for it. It's, um, that's us. And I thought I've been, like this is, I don't know which play it is by me, but like I've been asked like, oh wow, it's so great to have all these queer bodies on stage. Um, thank you for bringing it to contemporary writing. And I think it's ridiculous because like, and then I ask people about Shakespeare 
or Ovid. Um, all the stories have been told since so many hundreds of years, but we are pioneers. That's, that's said in the beginning of the play. We are constant pioneers. We are like damned to be, oh, the first one, oh, I didn't know. Oh, sorry, I, oh, this is so beautiful. Thank you for telling me that. And I think that's really offensive. Um, so I used very obviously Ovid to prove that this story has been there since we've been there, like human beings. And if you go like, I don't know, I'm sure here also in US, but when I've been to Rome, I've been to every possible museum and all the sculptures are there. And I mean, they were not made up. People, what we call today intersexual or transgender people, like we need all these labels for people, they've always been there and there are proofs for it and art is there to prove it. And um, I, I guess I was trying to make the point that it's not just a new thing we brought up because we are so, you know, um, spoiled in the Western society that we have time for queer concepts. So how was the critical reception of the piece? Well, it's Berlin, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, very, very diff different. Like, of course, like, I don't know if you, you're familiar with the Berliner scene, but we are like, we are super critical about everything and then we're even more critical about being critical. Um, <laughs> There have been a lot of discussions, I knew it, um, especially on terms of representation. I wrote this piece because I, I work in Maxim Gorky Theater, which is not having a very diverse ensemble. And I knew that we have um, not only cis person in the ensemble, so I knew there are gonna be bodies who can perform it. At the same time, other theaters um, asked to, uh, like for permission to stage the play, and in the end, they they checked me out because they said, "Oh, we can, we don't have," a, and then they didn't even finish the sentence. <laughs> you know, like it's like, <laughs> you know, um, and I found that very interesting. Um, but also the fact that I don't think that a transgender person necessarily has to play a transgender person, or uh, that like a Turkish character has to play, like you know, you, you know all this. this discussion, but we have them, and I think it's productive to have them, I'm not against it. At the same time, of course, we have the old, old school conservatives, like in the premiere, there was a guy sitting next to my mom, and he, of course, didn't know that it's my mom. He was like, when the gay scene started, and they do it like really hot, I mean, like they dance like for 10 minutes, it's, it's awesome, and like this guy nearly puked. <laughs> and, um, and he started to talk to my mother about it because she looks like she, she's like a decent, beautiful lady. And she's like, why, why are we watching this? <laughs> so we have them too, of course. Uh, and I love it. I, I love the conversation. I, I love the fight. I love the fact that my mother stands up for our rights. So, like, you know, she's, she's forced to be in a situation to say something about not her world, but uh, a person who loves isn't part of it. Um, and I guess that make, makes us all better in a way, or force us to deal with things, which makes the world a little better. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you mentioned the casting. That's something that I actually want to talk with Mallory about as well. Um, I think you had, your, your choice of casting was fabulous. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, I mean, actually, I, I actually Skyped with Sasha to talk specifically about casting because um, I just, wanted some background around the choices that she made and she was really open to whatever I wanted to do but um, so I mean I always think like I mean this has been fun because there's two two people on the cast who I who I've never worked with but I know really well and I always have one to work with um, and so I was like right away I was like oh you know and it just worked out that they were available and then the rest I was like on a like a, a mission asking people, do you know? And it took a really long time. Um, but I think sometimes that, that that's really fun about doing readings or is that it's sort of an adventure and it's a, it's a way to kind of work with people you've never worked with before. Um, and so it's like all casting, I think, you know, there's, there's a few pillars of certainty and then there's the sort of adventure um, and the luck of the, the draw, I mean, I'm asking people who are really great and they're giving me really great recommendations. Um, so, but it always feels like, oh, you know, like certain things fall down the ground and you're like, okay, that's what we're gonna, you know. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I did this thing where, you know, I found um, <coughs> Amir and Moti who were Russian and um, Israeli 
And I was just really interested in the conversation we could have quickly as a group of artists. Um, and with Azure, just about like this comparison, or once you know the sort of intent of the playwright in the context, what, like what is the, how do we bring ourselves to it? And like, what's the conversation around that, even the playful conversation that actors have? And so I think it was an interesting mix of um, matching and not matching in a way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, um, I don't know if I have more to say about it than that, but. Uh, um, I think, well, I always think, well, it's in order for play to work in different cultural contexts, I think casting is such an important, it's such an important, important part of the process, right? Because you don't wanna just put it in like a certain, uh, you know, drawer. Okay, so that's the German play. We're gonna cast people, uh, cast people that look all very German and yeah. have like a thick German accent. I you mean, know, I will say that I, I, I did, I was cognizant that we are in New York, and I did want to sort of present it differently than maybe Sasha had, like in terms of the casting, as as opposed to just um, because I I was interested in the intersection of like how New Yorkers would meet the play through Berlin in a way. So I did I did want to cast it differently, also than you had cast it or it, how it was cast, um, but uh, just because I think it's always fun to kind of when you give your play away and like different group of people, different bodies do it, it brings up different things, so. Yeah. Well, before I open it to the audience, one I last question. Three, four okay, so then Maybe I open it right away. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, no, okay. Um, was it the first time you saw the play in English? Uh, yeah. So what's, what's your take here? <laughs> How did you like it? Well, I obviously loved it. Uh, because the guys are so great, I mean, like <laughs> you guys were awesome, um, and I think it really works great. Also, because German and English are very close, mm -hmm. I, and I think the humor also is very close, and like the staging was really on point. So, I, yeah, I think that really works. Uh, also, like my inspiration, like the plays I really like to read and to see, I'm more from UK and US, so I feel kind of close to this theater culture, anyway. So now you already mentioned that you're also a writer in residence at the Maxim Gorky Theater. You're also artistic director of their studio, yeah? Uh, yeah, a former. Uh, oh, a former. I gave it up to write the book. Oh, that's right. And she's also, she just finished a novel. So that's coming out in September in Germany and then hopefully also here at some point in translation, right? Yeah, well, that translation, they already like signed a contract up for me for the English translation. So it means in a year you got the book. Mm -hmm. So, well, all right, well, even though you're not artistic director of Studio Ya anymore, so what was, I'm still curious, so what was your, what did you do there? So what was your uh, That's a very long story. To, to make it short, m like we were like an uh, um, artistic crew coming to the State Theater from a very like off-off scene of Berlin. Um, and we were kind of like a disaster for Berlin because they never seen a group like us in the State Theater. Shaman Lankov would be our like our, um, artistic attendant, and this is a woman with a Turkish background, communist, everything you can think of, and 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 Shaman told me like we have two stages in Maxim Gorky, a big stage and a small stage, and she said I don't have money for the small stage. We would have to close it, or you take it and do whatever, but with no money. And I said yes, um, and I thought Berlin doesn't need off spaces. Berlin is full with cool of theaters, we need uh, places uh, where we can negotiate. We need uh, political spaces. We need, we need to understand theater also as a part of network. We need to connect to dance and discussions and demonstrations. So Studia became more that kind of a project and it increased and it's beautiful that it's, it's like, it's great growing. Um, and like there's so many things to tell and to say about this since we don't have time. I just can say it was a very, um, it was, it was, it still is kind of like this, it's just a space, it's a network, it's a, it's a way of thinking, I guess. Um, and it's not only theater, and it's just, it's partly in the Maxim Gorky, but it's also in magazines and on the street, on demonstrations, when the people from the network, they go on the demonstrations, they send me videos. Um, and uh, I was writing my book, I, I left Berlin for Istanbul, and I was writing my book in Istanbul, and I got, through a whole year since I left, uh, videos from demonstrations, and that was also Studio Ya, yeah, and that made me very proud. Well, 
I think that was. Uh, we have a we have a real reception, and we hopefully also you will join us in Kentucky on the twelfth and thirty sixth. So we organize in Germany. We make one ride. It's on thirty sixth called the Archive Bar between Gibbs and uh, and, uh, and Madison, right? It's on, on the uh, on the south side. So I hope you, uh, you will be joining us. And so, um, thank you for moderating. Thank you for coming all the way from Berlin. And uh, Mallory, thank you for that.